the, what we do is basically promoting international human rights standards uh, within the corporate sector, the non-state actor. Um, there's a lot of um, progress in that regard in recent years, uh, moving on from the fact that companies have no responsibility for human rights to an increased understanding that they do have responsibility for human rights. But I'm not going to go deeply into um, standard issues of business and human rights in this uh, presentation because we are talking about mass atrocities here. We are talking about issues that are uh, not normal. Uh, we are not going to talk about issues such as uh, uh, union rights in themselves, but looking at it when they have a direct bearing. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk about some examples, set out certain parameters, and towards the end talk about what states and international community can do. So at the outset, let me say that business is not good or bad. Business is business. It is an entity. It does things. Some of those things have good effects. Some of those things are bad. What follows from that? Uh, it is not necessarily that the good that follows is because the company intended it to be so nor does it follow that the bad that follows is what company intended it so. The whole idea of intent is extremely complicated and not very simple. Uh, what we can do is try to come up with a framework and system that encourages businesses to do more of the good and less of the bad, mitigate the risks, eliminate them in certain contexts, and it does mean in certain contexts that therefore they should stop doing business in a particular country for a particular time. The good that business does is known. They create jobs, they pay taxes, companies raise prosperity, they create opportunities and provide what people need. I mean, there are places where they may not have, they may have to depend only on well water and a water supply company comes in, creates a network of pipelines and filtered water, which is a good thing. So there are lots of things that companies can do which can actually lead to realization of certain economic, social and cultural rights. The impact of business with the civil and political rights, are, however, is more complicated. Um, and that's often where one has to look at the adverse impacts first. Um, there are some areas where there are uh, direct bad or um, adverse impacts. A uh, company that provides weapons, for example, is a good example of that. Or private military companies, their conduct is very directly related to things that can go wrong and that can lead to massive human rights abuses. But the more interesting and challenging question which people have been grappling with and some of the most seminal work on this has been done by Andrew Clapham and in Geneva uh, is to look at the role of non-state actor when it comes to complicity, when the company is indirect um, contributor to or benefiting from something that's terrible. Examples, what do I mean by contributing to an atrocity? I am a diamond trader, I get my diamonds polished in Surat in India, I buy my diamonds from Antwerp in Belgium. The diamonds get to Antwerp through extremely complicated network of, um, of uh, supply chain from Sierra Leone or Liberia straight to, um, to Antwerp. And then I go and, and buy. It's an extremely opaque but extremely reliable at the same time system. There's a huge amount of trust. Very little is written down on paper. And it's interesting that uh, culturally, two communities have played a very important role because communities tend to trust each other more. One is the Jewish one, and the other is the Palanpuri Gujarati one. These are the ones that kind of lead in that industry in the diamond trade. Um, but uh, until the Sierra Leone conflict came up, these companies used to think of the four C's of diamonds, clarity, cut, character, and carrot. So the, the clarity was our color, sorry, clarity, cut, color and carrot. So if it was a certain carrot, if it was a certain color, its value was more. NGOs around the world reminded there's a fifth C involved, which is conflict. And it was conflict that was what needed to be stopped. The traders in Antwerp, the traders in, in Surat, the traders in New York were not doing anything to create human rights abuses per se. But their actions were transferring financial resources in the hands of people like Fode Sanko and the Revolutionary United Front, the consequence of which was that they were able to get access to weapons, to machetes, and so on, with which they spread the reign of terror and commit mass atrocities. Being an extremely elastic uh, product, I mean, you, none of us really need to buy a diamond. We can live our entire lives without a diamond, and nothing would happen to us, right? And given that, it became rather easy for the company to, companies to realize that this is a problem, that we cannot have a huge adverse campaign against us, and therefore they were among the first to join when, sh when um, 
Norway, Canada, Switzerland, and other countries took lead in developing the Kimberley process for uh, conflict diamonds. So that's where there's, a, there's an industry which was being contributing to a particular conflict, realized it was a problem, and acted to change it. Another example of this could be benefiting from, where a company is operating in an area, thinks that it is paying taxes to the legitimate authority, which is the government. But as uh, Navi Pillai was saying earlier, some governments are unwilling to protect rights, and some are unable to protect rights. And in that kind of a context, if there are abuses, and they might be benefiting from the cre situation created by a particular um, context. So that's where uh, we have. And then, of course, there are the so-called bad guys, the predatory companies. These are companies that are the enablers. These are the companies that are uh, the spoilers. They like conflict because they like the uncertainty. They like the increase in profits that follow from that. And to give one particular example of that would be someone like Franz van Anrath, who was a Dutch businessman, who essentially was supplying certain chemicals to Saddam Hussein in Iraq in, in, in the late 1980s. If you mix the two chemicals, there was only one effect, and that was to produce mustard gas. And anyone with basic chemistry would have known that. Um, he claimed he did not know about it. Uh, the Dutch prosecutor sued the businessman. Um, and he said, I didn't know that this would be the use to which it would be put. The lower court, I think, gave him an eight-year prison term. He protested, and he said that, you know, he appealed against it. The higher court said, yes, this is gross injustice. You should have 19 years in prison, not eight years. So, I mean, sometimes you, you have situations where courts and prosecutors do take these cases seriously and follow. And there are many such examples of businesses which have been implicated in directly contributing to conflict. What tends to happen when international community looks at corporations is that they tend to see them as a source for finance, for creating jobs for creating stable conditions, and they're right. If you have an economy with well-functioning system of rule of law and businesses come, jobs will get created, prosperity will start, taxes will get paid. But businesses don't have the capacity, the skills, the expertise, the mandate, or the authority to act in place of state. Sometimes they might get it right, sometimes they might respond to their own values. And very often, the four or five examples I could think of today of businessmen, or who sometimes were diplomats, took extraordinary steps to prevent mass atrocities or huge human rights abuses, have done so responding to their inner conscience. There is Ho Feng Shan in China, who was the diplomat, he was a businessman and then a diplomat in Austria, and gave thousands of visas, exit visas, to the Jewish community in the war. Paul Rusisa Bagina, uh, whose story we all know through the film Hotel Rwanda, um, he was under no real obligation to do what he did, but he did respond to his inner conscience. Arne Rinan, who was a Norwegian ship captain, and he was, he had a ship called MV Tampa. He wanted to take um, certain refugees that he had found in a ship that was listing into Australia, and Australia said no, and Australia said you have to take them elsewhere. But by, under international law, Australia was the nearest port of call, and he insisted on going and said, fine, if you want to send your Australian Navy after me, do so. And he succeeded. He was able to bring them in. Uh, Raoul Wallenberg himself, again, was a businessman. And of course, Oskar Schindler, who was a businessman. And somewhere along the way, as he was acting in the war, he realized something really, really horrible and became the, showed the greatness that he had in him. So there are, but if each of these cases, if we look at it, frankly, they're responding to their inner conscience. They're not responding to a law. They're not responding to anything that they've been told to do. They've done things because they want to do that. So the international community which wants to look at business needs to look at these things, including the framework. It's nice to get businesses to create jobs and to pick up the tab, particularly when it comes to building schools, hospitals, and jobs. But very often, the extractive companies, what they know very well is how to get oil out of the ground or minerals out of ground. They don't know how to build a school, how to design a curriculum. Let there be taxes. Let them not undermine the state by decapacitizing it and by doing things that ideally the state should be doing. So what can the state do in this kind of a context when it operates in, in and, and there are businesses which are active or want to be active? It's a continuum starting from carrots to sticks. The carrots are inform the companies about the law, educate them about the context in which they are operating, Reward good behavior, give them tax incentives, give those companies uh, export finance uh, privileges. Provide disincentives when they get things bad. Put them on blacklist, put them on smart sanctions. Start showing them risks, what the risks are where they operate. Then to warn them, 
and if it is necessary to fill the prosecutorial gap and prosecute the companies which get it wrong. Right now what tends to happen is that businesses often don't have the information and are often acting on their own. Governments don't exactly know where business fits in because international law may or may not apply. There, there's a lack of clarity about it. International humanitarian law certainly applies to businesses, and in particular in terms of conflict. And the government itself could be complicit, and it doesn't know what to do with a company. But there are tools available for companies which they need to be reminded of. There are the guiding principles for business and human rights that the UN Human Rights Council adopted in 2011 that very clearly laid down the due diligence steps companies must take to understand the risks of their impacts and then mitigate those risks. There is also the importance that they must comply with the law. There is an initiative called the Red Flags Initiative of which I'm part and when we talked about it to insurance companies, saying that you know, companies should not use forced labor, companies should not aid and abet violence, they should not break sanctions. They said, of course, this is crystal clear. What you're saying is companies should not break the law. And therefore, the compliance part needs to be stressed further. There is, of course, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which talks about transfer of revenue from the company to the state. But the transparency that the communities need is very often at the local level. They don't really need to know how much money is paid to the capital, but what the company is doing on the ground. And of course, there are the voluntary principles for security and human rights, which creates rules for companies how to protect their assets and their people. So companies, when they start out and operate in conflict zones, and particularly where there are mass atrocities, often don't know what they should be doing. There are things they can do in an immediate context, helping refugees move out. A classic stories of what Chevron did in Nigeria in, I think, 2003 or 4, when there was a conflict between the Ijo community and the Itsekiri community in Ugborodo. And the Itsekiris came and started knocking the doors of the Chevron facility, saying, save our lives. Chevron made its helicopters available to fly the people to a safer area. It did not have to do it, but it started doing it. I think the more we start thinking creatively of learning from these good practices, and creating a framework of how companies can operate in mass atrocities, then we will be able to reinforce the good and mitigate and eliminate and at times punish the bad behavior. Thank you.